Well, of course we're friends. In a more conventional film, the two duelists would become sworn enemies. But while they recuperate in hospital, these two professional soldiers become the best of friends. I love your... The role of the German soldier went to the Austrian actor Anton Walbrook. Your Miss Hunter. He really was a, a, a fantastic actor, and he plays this um, Theo, um, the great friend of, of Wink Candy's, of, of Blimps. Um, uh, and they meet early on uh, at a time really when Europe was at its last civilized state before the First World War when you have these marvelous Viennese waltzes going on in this cafe and, uh, and um, the, the whole Juncker Prussian um, uh, mentality of, 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 of German militarism with its codes of honor and uh, dueling and so on. I love your Miss Hunter. Your cuckoo. Oh, nein, ich, ich nein cuckoo. Uh, you cuckoo, because Miss Hunter loves me. Congratulations. When did it happen? Why don't I know about it? Theo Kretschmar Schuldorf, Clive's very proud of himself when he learns how to say his name, <laughs> is, uh, is uh, part of a line of characters which the archers created the sympathetic German, and a man who does his duty, even though his duty makes him an enemy of Britain. He's on the other side, as it were. They went on creating these sympathetic Germans, and they were always at great pains to distinguish between a German and a Nazi. May I kiss the bride? Theo marries Edith, and it's only on returning home that Clive realizes how much he loves her. Goodbye, Clive. Goodbye, Edith, old girl. But in typical Archer's style, the emptiness of his life is depicted in comic fashion. I hope we'll meet again sometime. Some of the parts of it, of course, now would be so politically incorrect as almost to, almost to be unscreenable, you'd imagine. For example, the, the bit where uh, a lacuna, I suppose, in his uh, career, um, while he's waiting for another war, uh, he goes off to, to Africa as a big game hunter. You see a room in his house in Mayfair, um, just filled with huge heads of elephants and lions. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, leopards and all kinds of things which are now deeply endangered. I can't think of anything in the cinema of the 1940s that has that same sort of sense of wit. I mean, it's the kind of thing you really can imagine a 1960s filmmaker doing out of a sense of irreverence. We don't need to have the boring details. We don't need to see Clive in these places. We just need to know that all he did was go and shoot big animals. <laughs> But I think as we see that sequence and just think about the, the boldness of doing it as a rapid montage sequence, using sound and music, it, it just shows you how, even in 1943, the archers were kind of thinking about a new syntax for film. The director of photography on Colonel Blimp was Georges Perinal, but the cameraman behind these bizarre sequences was Jack Cardiff. I was a junior staff cameraman at Technicolor, been for two or three years and uh, doing odd bits but I, my yearning ambition naturally was to photograph a big feature film and I was actually working on second unit for Blimp at the time and I had one shot to do which was a much more complicated one and more interesting of a, a wall with, with animals stuffed animals heads on the wall and it was difficult to light because with the, all the horns it made mass shadows all over the place but being on the second unit, I didn't have this pressure to work fast. I was able to work things out. So I suppose I'd done a good job on it. And I heard a voice behind me as I looked through the camera say, uh, very interesting. I looked round and there was the great Michael Powell. And uh, he was sort of looking at it sort of quizzically and looking at the lighting. And then he turned to me and he said, uh, would you like to photograph my next picture? And I said, oh, yes, Mr. Powell, of course, I'd like that very much. He said, well, we start in six months, and he was off. He never used to walk, he used to bound, you know, always full of energy. And I thought later, I thought, well, he's just said that, you know, and he'll forget all about it. But Powell didn't forget about the inventive young cameraman. Jack Cardiff would go on to become a key member of the Archer's team, photographing such Technicolor epics as A Matter of Life and Death and Black Narcissus. 
One of the most celebrated cinematographers of the 20th century, he regards working with Powell as one of the most exciting periods of his career. Michael Powell is a cameraman's dream because he, uh, he instills enthusiasm in, into everybody. He's, he's enthusiastic himself and f very fast and thick, uh, thinks very quickly and so on. And he's, he welcomes any ideas. One of the few directors I know that hasn't got any any kind of chicken qualms about things, you know, if you say, Mickey, why don't we do this upside down or something? He'd, he'd say, do it, I love it, it's a great idea. You know, he'd never say, well, you know, a bit dodgy, don't, let's compromise, never any of that with Michael. Another important factor in Blimp was the work of the art department. Alfred Junger was the, uh, the what they called the art director of uh, the art department at that time. One of the great scenes there is uh, where he is visited in the prisoner of war camp on which was shot on the back lot or on the, the lot by the river bank at uh, Denham. Tail. It was not rather a touching scene with all the prisoners of war in the background. I think we had lots of cutouts and things in the background because it was meant to be thousands of prisoners of war then, but we didn't have uh, access to that number. And certainly as far as un German uniforms were concerned. Uh, yes, so we did use uh, quite a few there, interspersed, of course, with live crowd to uh, put the movement into the scene. The sets were beautiful sets. I mean, the, the Turkish bath set at the uh, beginning where he's captured um, and for that incidentally uh, Roger Livesey was rather a life athletic young man and he had to have this enormous Colonel Blimp tummy which uh, uh, Tony Sforzini the makeup man uh, had it made in plaster so if you, you can't see the join really but he's lying there with, with a, a plaster tummy very uh, noteworthy <laughs> The second act of Colonel Blimp sees Clive back in action. The year is 1918, and Europe has been torn apart by the First World War, a conflict very different from those of Clive's youth. This is Dead Cow Crossroads, sir. Question is whether that's the church with the double tower or the estaminated pond. But for Clive, one thing remains the same, the memory of his lost love. Once again played by Deborah Carr, Barbara is a young nurse who Clive will later marry. Come on, Wind. The final act of Blimp takes place in 1942, at the height of the Second World War. The gentlemen soldiers of Clive's youth have been replaced with a new breed. Clive is now a founding member of the Home Guard, and lost love resurfaces once more this time in the form of Angela, his driver. Clive will also meet Theo again, in very different circumstances. I wouldn't be surprised if this fellow really disliked us. He comes to England twice in his life. The first time he's a prisoner, and the second time he's just about to be one. Theo Kretschmar Schuldorf ends the film as a refugee from Germany, 